Hello, everybody. Welcome to another amazing episode of our Python series. And in this episode, we'll be looking at the continuation of the SPI, that's the Standardized Precipitation Index. And in this video, we are going to look at it being applied on a multidimensional data set in the NetCDF format. You can then use it on, I mean, any multidimensional data set in different formats also. And so if you haven't seen the initial video, which was using a tabular data, you can then go back to the main page and check the last, I mean, video that was uploaded. We have standardized presentation index drought and flood monitor, and that would help you out. Okay. So in today's um, video, like I said, this is what we'll be looking at on the multidimensional data sets. And so I would upload the data again, I mean, the code onto the GitHub page so you can still follow. Now, in this context, uh, I made me use of the desk, which is to allow for, you know, sort of uh, run or let's say define particular memory size and then also processor units that would work on the code. And then once it gets engaged, when it's free, it's released, its memory is released and then allowed for another system, or sort of another line of the code to be run. Now, there will be another video where I introduce this into more detail, but I mean, for status, we can ignore this for now and move on to the main thing. All right, so we have our various packages being imported here. We imported warnings, that's to um, clear off any error signals that would be popping up from here. I mean, the warnings, not necessarily errors. I mean, the warnings that will be popping up. And then we also imported XRA, which we'll use more. And I've also imported, you know, pandas for certain activities, NumPy. Um, and then from SciPy, we imported stats again. Now, this whole thing has been explained in detail in the earlier video. So if you go back to it, you find how it works. And well, I wouldn't need the M dates again in this context. So we can ignore that for now. And then that's pretty much it. And also the fact that I want my plots to show in the same frame of the cell. So I then bring the percentage math plot lib in line, which is something that um, Jupyter Notebook understands. Okay, so then we load the data sets. And what we are doing is to call, because the data that will be stored from here will be in a data array format. So we use XRA, which we imported as XR.open data set. And we pass in the name of the data that's the file here. And then I also just extracted the presentation components because the SPI would be did in just presentation. So I extract there's a presentation from it. And then um, because the data was quite huge and it was taking quite a long time to work. I mean, it's a global data and then from 1901 to 2018. So I then slice the data. Now in this case, I've just limited it to um, just West Africa. You can also use it for whatever location you're working on. And so with this data set RR, which I've called as a presentation data, I select the longitude I need using the slicing method and then the latitude and also the time. And to make this effective, I just used three years. I mean, just four years, 2015 to 2018. All right. So now we come to the function that we used previously, and then we try to see the modifications we're doing here. So this time we define the SPI. The DS is our data, just as we did in the first video. The trash is the number of months or years or whatever SPI format you're using. In this case, we are using months. So if I pass in three, that means we'll be an SPI three of let's say three months um, sort of SPI. And then because there's a multi-dimensional data, I brought in this argument, which is dimension, so that we could pass in the dimension along with to perform the SPI. So for instance, we are going to perform this on the time. So I pass in here time as a string. Okay. And then every other detail in the function stays the same. We find the moving averages, but then over here, we specify that it's going to be on the time component. That's why we are going to have the moving averages. So if I pass in um, threshold of three, it means it's going to perform a three month uh, moving average. Uh, we don't expect it to center. So I pass the center to false. And then because it's a moving average, we are definitely going to find the average over the dimension we specified, which will be the time, All right? 
then after getting the moving averages, we find the um, lanes of it as the natural logs. And then we use the same concept as explained before, wherever it's infinity, we um, sort of change those to NANDs. That's it. I think I gave a detailed explanation in the first video. So if you miss out on anything, you can check from the very first one. Then we find the mean again, this time by specifying the dimension to find the means on. So there's a multi-dimensional data. So it's finding per each location. So we need to specify the dimension. We do same for the um, overall mean of the moving averages, specify the dimension, the summation of the natural logs, we specify the dimensions again, over which we get the sum, All right? And then when we are done, this is one key aspect. So um, we find the total number of um, sort of parameters or data for each particular grid, because I mean, we've done the moving average, so it's gonna be minus the beginning, Parts, which is the the early, the thresholds that you set. So if you set a four-man threshold, it means the first four, I mean the first three will be taken off, and then we'll start from the fourth because I mean the moving average would start from the fourth component. So what we did in here was to from the natural log data set. Now the data set I have varies in the sense that it has the time as the first dimension. Then I think the longitude and latitude we could always verify from here. And I could explain why we did that. So if I pass this back in here, say um, DS underscore RR underscore West Africa. Yeah, then we run that. Okay, so now you see that the presentation varies over time, then latitude and then longitude, right? So that means the time is the first dimension and then it moves on and on latitude and then longitude. So. You can take this one off now. So, all right, so what we did in here was to, you're trying to get the count over the time dimension, but then we need to omit the nans. There's a missing point. So we omit just the beginning parts, all right? So if the threshold was three, then it means three minus one. So it means the first two, I ignored, and then it gives us a count from the third to the end along the time dimension. Then when we are done, we find uh, E, we compute E, compute alpha, compute beta, and these are, I mean, default sort of computations that I've explained already in the first video. Now, in order to get a gamma distribution, we would have to apply the function across all the dimensions. So what I did in this case was to use the lambda approach use the lambda and so this becomes a function name which is set as a variable and then we make use of the lambda and then pass in the dummy arguments over here so it will take the data the a and the scale and then from there we are finding the cdf that's a gamma distribution which again i've explained from the very first video by passing in the inputs of data and then a and then the scale all right, so we pass in the dummy arguments and then we are done. Now we come back to apply the function. So in order to find the gamma itself, make use of xre.apply function. And then we pass in the function that we've defined, which is a gamma function. So the gamma function, comma, and then the data set. So the data components, as we've described, per the dummy argument. So the data is passed in as a moving averages. We find, we pass in the alpha, and then the beta as the scale. And that should find the gamma distribution for each particular grid. And then when we are done now, we need to find the norm inverse, right? That's the inverse of the CDF. So we then again perform another, um, we use a lambda function again. And so we pass in just an argument of data and then what it's supposed to do is to find the inverse. So we use sc.norm.ppf, which I've explained again as the inverse of the CDF in the earlier video. And we pass in here the data. Now look is set to zero. I mean, as the I mean, because we're trying to normalize the code distribution and then the scale in this case will be the standard deviation. So, I mean, an average of zero standard deviation, um, acceptable range of say one, and then yeah, that's it. And so when we are done, we now pass in the norm inverse 
by, I mean, over the entire data. And so now we are finding the normalized SPI. So we use XRA dot apply view func again, and then pass in the function name, which is a norm inf, and then the data, because I mean, this dummy argument will need data. And so the data in this case will be the gamma results that were attained from here, the gamma distribution that were attained. Then when we are done, we return all the various outputs. Okay, so now this is the function that we built and then we come to where we are applying it. So in this um, test, which is a three month SPI. And so in the DA underscore data, which is okay, I could have used the DSRR underscore stuff, but I then wrote it back to the data array, which is the original data array. Okay, so I go back to the DA underscore data and then I define a new variable, which is SPI3. And then I call the SPI function on the data set, which is the West Africa data. And then I pass in the time, which is the month of three, that's the threshold. And then the dimension being the time dimension as a string, as I explained, you pass that in. And this should produce all these outputs. That's a moving average, the natural log, the mu, the sum, N, A, alpha, beta, gamma, and then the norm SPI. Now this is what we are interested in, which is the, I think that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's the tenth, the the tenth um, output. But then Python is in the sense that's from zero, so we make use of the array subsetting with element nine, being the tenth output, the SPI, and that should produce the SPI information. So. So after performing this, now we go back to check our DA data and we notice that a new variable has been added, which is the SPI3 containing particular elements. So now we can visualize the SPI information. So I call DA data and then SPI3 and I just chose uh, I chose just one particular year because this was from 2015 to 2018. So I just selected the time of 2015 then make use of the plot. And then I set my color map as red, blue. And then I, because this 2015 has like 12 whole months, I'm using a facet plot. So what I can do is to just tell it to create the columns on the dimension of time. So the columns would be on the time and then the column wrapping will be how many um, columns to have. And so I indicate here four columns. Comes you have one, two, three, four columns. And then the minimum value for setting a color bar, I mean, I set it to minus 2.5 and a maximum 2.5. So that whatever is beyond it would make use of the extend color bar option. And then those would be like the darker shades of the red and the blue. And okay, so now let me take this off so that I can explain why I think that there. So because we wrote the SBI3 back to the DA data, now the coordinates of latitude and longitude do not change. And so if I plot, it's still gonna be the entire global coordinates that would show with the data just showing as a small point. Okay. Because this is just West Africa from within the globe. All right, so. Um, it's taking a bit of time on mine. Okay, so now you can see that it just positions them where they are supposed to be, but we have a lot of white space. And so what I did was to just use the PLT function and set the Y limit and the X limit to just the bounding box of West Africa and then replot. And that brings it back to, you know, the normal by cutting off the white spaces. Okay, and that's, simply how to get your SPI. And like I said, we started from 2015. This was a three month SPI. So month one will be all nines, month two will be all nines, month three would indicate something. We see some dryness over that three months in the northern parts and then some wetness in the um, more southern parts of West Africa. And yeah, it, the whole transitions are seen or captured. All right, so if we make use of say 2016, I expect that there should be data from the very first month because it's a continuation. Okay. Okay, so 
that's what we have showing. We can see that February 2016 per um, the index we computed seems to be very dry in West Africa and then also in the Central African part and then some sort of isolated locations in the northern parts that's the Sahara, Sahel, I mean Sahelian and then the Sahara parts. Yeah, and so that's how you get your SPI on the net CD of data or multi-dimensional multi data sets. I believe you've learned a lot and so We'll still be continuing with the climate indices. We still have a couple more, the REI, that's rainfall anomaly index, the modified REI, the SPEI, and a couple more we'll be looking at. So just stick with us. I mean, if you've not subscribed yet, don't forget to subscribe. So we keep learning. If you're new here, do subscribe. And when you're done, just do us a favor, share within your network, let others hear of the great stuff we are doing and we keep learning, we keep growing. If you have any question, just leave them in the comments section and then the team will address it. Don't forget to like too and have a wonderful time. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.